Welcome to the Crit House My 5 series, where photographers delve into their creative evolution by discussing five influential images. In this episode, we explore the visual narratives that have shaped the artistic journey of photographer, writer, and educator Henry Horenstein. His five images include work from Charles LeBlanc, Ouija, Jim Marshall, Lewis Hine, and Ed Vanderelskin. So Henry Horenstein is with us today here on the Crit House. He is an artist and photographer. He's a filmmaker, uh, maybe primarily an educator, and certainly a writer. He is the author of over 35 books, one of which was very influential to me in my early photography days. He studied at the Rhode Island School of Design, and he is now a professor of photography at RISD. Some of his more noteworthy projects include Honky Tonk, Portraits of Country Music, and in 2022, Speedway 1972 was published, and then last year, We Sort of People was published as well. In recent years, uh, Henry has been working on short documentary films, and Mr. Horenstein, it is, uh, it is quite the honor to have you on the program. Thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Jeff. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, I gave you a little thumbnail of what uh, I know about you, but how do you talk about yourself uh, in this photographic world? Well, pretty much like we just described. I'm a photographer and a, a teacher. Uh, I make films now sometimes, and um, that's about it. <laughs> 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 it's a, a very short synopsis for a distinguished yeah, career. Yeah, well, it's my life, really, you know. <laughs> so, okay, so you, uh, we have five images. You had to yeah. choose five images from the, I guess, billions of uh, images that are out there in the world these days. How did you choose what five images uh, you'd talk yeah. about? Well, that was a, a tough question, I'm uh, asking me to do that. Um, I, I tried a combination of things. One is to show pictures of photographers I like obviously, um, and maybe have influenced me. Um, also, I've got one or two in there that are kind of vernacular, you know, that are not well-known photographers necessarily, but they're interesting pictures. And I think a lot of the work that we see in the world is just that. And um, I try to throw that in. I try to throw some things that were, this is five pictures, but <laughs> that were, um, uh of interest to me the subjects are interest to to me so here's that here's that picture of secretariat i don't is this the belmont the preakness or the kentucky yeah, derby belmont stakes that were won by like 27 or 8 lengths um and you can see he's, he, he was in a common gallop he wasn't even all out to win i love horse racing so that's you know part of it and i've been involved in it for a long time did a couple of books on racing, one called Racing Days, and one called Thoroughbred Kingdoms. I, I don't know who Charles LeBanc is, but I just like that picture because it's about horse racing. It's a dramatic moment. It's also one that um, I think anyone could really appreciate, but um, if you're into racing, like racing and so forth, you realize what a monumental, monumental moment that was. I mean, that's just these are the best horses in the world and he's just walked over them basically. Ron Turcott, the jockey, he fell off a horse and uh, became paralyzed. And he's still alive and still paralyzed, but great jockey, great great horse and a tragic story at the end. And this is this is interesting too, just like from a, from a photographic standpoint, because it doesn't, you know, the, like the rules, um, the rule, you know, you've got, you've got all this empty space right in the middle of it, but that's the story, right? It's that distance of how yeah. far ahead of everybody else secretary it was in this race. It's an incredible, it was an incredible race. One of the great moments probably in the history of sports, although a lot of people don't count horse racing in that right. uh, category. But Well, we go from uh, one of the all-time legendary great horses to one of the legendary yeah. photographers of the world, <laughs> Ouija. Ouija, yes. Um, well, he was one of, and still is one of my favorite photographers and uh, one of the reasons, and it also has to do with the vernacular quality of a lot of this work, is the work I like, rather, is um, I think we make a lot of, uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of people make a lot of photography that it's very special, it's very creative, it's very artistic and everything. And it's got that, of course. 
but um, it's also every day too. You know, we take great pictures and useful pictures every day. We all do. And um, Ouija was not a trained photographer in those days. Uh, well, he was a photojournalist, you'd say, but there, you know, there wasn't a whole industry of the photo art world like there is today. I teach at uh, an art school where the students come in and they have a, an artist statement before they have art, you know, I mean, they are, <laughs> they are you know, and Ouija was just this cigar smoking, you know, kind of uh, an educated immigrant. He just worked like crazy, he had a good uh, sense of timing and resourcefulness and made some great pictures, but he didn't do it artfully. He did it. Uh, it was his job. And he also uh, had, was friends with a lot of people on the street, you know, like it was New York City and like um, doormen um, in um, nice buildings would know what was sometimes what was going on. And he knew ambulance uh, drivers. And so he would fix up an ambulance as a dark room and pull the ambulance or his friend would pull the ambulance up to the ring. And when there was a picture made, he'd jump in, develop it while his friend took him to the newspaper. I wow. mean, he was a resourceful kind of guy. Yeah. Um, he thought he was spelling Ouija board because that was what he, but he didn't know how to spell. So he ended up with that spelling. Loop. Actually, I never heard that. But that's, <laughs> that's funny. I think so. Jim Marshall. And Johnny Cash with this iconic image. Well, I love um, uh, country music, as I think you know, and I did a book on it called Honky Tonk. Uh, Johnny Cash, well, he was definitely a country musician, but he, he also tried to sort of transcend it, I think. He was yeah. a po popular singer as well, had pop hits as well as country hits. Uh, and some people, and I kind of agree, think he was one of the first punks, <laughs> punk musicians. <laughs> You know, he didn't, I didn't say he didn't give a damn. He did, and he, you know, was very successful. He wouldn't have um, been as successful if he didn't really give a damn. But he wouldn't, you know, he didn't suffer fools. Let's put it that way. So uh, he was upset. I think it, it had to do with um, the country music establishment was starting to get away from country music into more pop music. And so they weren't giving awards to people like Johnny Cash mm -hmm. or playing his records or, you know, promoting him in any way. And I think it had to do with that somehow. Okay. But it, regardless, it was Johnny Cash, who may be arguably the greatest country figure, country music figure. And yep. um, also for me, the first album I ever bought was a Johnny Cash album. I was 10 years old and it was... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I was in the Melody Shop, which was a you know the little uh, record store in New Bedford. I was in there one time. I had a dollar. I I wanted to buy a record, and uh, there was a guy in there called Paul Clayton. I was a folk singer. He was a, a later a friend of Bob Dylan's and kind of a figure in the folk revival time. Uh, but I didn't know any of that. He just lived in New Bedford. He was yeah. from New Bedford, and uh, he said to me, "Hey man, you got to get this record." And he went into the cut out, you know, the remainder records, the ones that weren't selling. And he said, you got to get this one. This is the best record ever. And it was Johnny Cash sings Hank Williams on oh. Sunday. And uh, I bought it for a buck. I'm sure uh, she gave me a deal. <laughs> and um, and I still got it. Lewis Hine. Well, I, this picture may have even been taken in New Bedford. Uh, oh, Lowell, Mass, uh, one of the factory towns back in the day. Lewis Hine was a photographer, for sure, and a good one. But he was also kind of a social worker. I mean, not officially, but he was um, very liberal politically, and he was uh, he had certain causes that he really pushed hard. And the biggest one, the one he's best known for, is to try to uh, eliminate or at least minimize child labor. Yeah. And, uh, in the mid-1910s, 1914, 15, whatever, little kids, underage kids were working in these danger in factories and dangerous, aside from the fact that they weren't going to school, they were working often in dangerous conditions in the coal mines and, you know, factories, unprotected factories. And 
So uh, there were a number of people, good thinking people who try to get laws changed, uh, laws made to change that situation. And they did. 1914, 1915 child labor laws uh, came in and uh, did a lot of good, I think. And uh, Lewis Hahn used his camera to try to affect social change. And um, so that's why I had him there. And also, I studied history originally before photography. So this kind of story and what uh, Hein and others like him did was um, very much in my mind when I started out. Ed van der Elsken. Yeah, van der Elsken, I, a highly underrated photographer, I think. And I, I believe in Europe, he's much better known. Um, yeah. He died in 1990, I think, but something like that. And, um, and he lived a pretty full life. He was in his 60s, I think, when he died. Uh, but he was kind of a hippie photographer, and uh, he was, uh, I guess you'd say a photojournalist. He traveled the world, did a lot of books. Um, this particular book, the picture was from a book called Love on the Left Bank, and mm -hmm. it was kind of a um, uh, socio-documentary. He made up a story that was kind of true, kind of not true, about this young woman who came to Paris from, uh, from the country, from rural uh, France and trying to make a life as a model and what she, you know, she met people, she had uh, romances, she had disappointments and successes and and it was about her. And it was partly true, uh, you know, I think, but also partly probably poetic license played a role. But another, re anyway, for a while after he died, and this is true, I think of a lot of very good photographers, if they don't have someone behind them, you know, a family or a gallery, a museum curator, somebody who's got some influence or money, um, they're probably going to disappear. They just disappear. That's right. Disappear. Because who's going to keep them in, you know, in, and when, when, when I started out, my first book was by Ed Van Der Elske. It was a book called Sweet Life. And I knew about it because in my photo one class, I took with Arthur Siegel at Harvard Summer School. I didn't go to Harvard, but I took a summer school class. Um, he was a book, got, the teacher, Arthur Siegel, was a book, collector and he brought in Ed van der Elsken uh, to show us and I remember that so well and actually during that time when I was starting in the 70s 80s into the 90s there were a lot of his books were published in the United States and then he kind of disappeared now these days as of the last few years not that long but you know it's been they've been around for a few years there is um, a, a van der Elsken archive um, at a major museum in Amsterdam. So he's sort of come back a little bit. Well, it's one of the things I like about this program is being introduced to uh, to photographers I hadn't heard of before, and this is one for me. So thank you for the for the yeah, introduction. So very, very good. It was a very good photographer. So Henry Hornstein, before we wrap up, uh, there's a sixth image that has been a part of this uh, uh, this discussion that we haven't talked about, and that's the one that is behind you. What's the story? Ah. Behind? Well, I'm working on a couple of projects. Um, in the South. One is this Texas project that I think will be a book in the fall, I hope. Uh, it's, it's called Miles and Miles of Texas. And uh, I, I've been photographing down there for a pretty long time, into the 70s. Uh, not as much as the last few years, I really stepped it up. I believe I got COVID twice in Texas. <laughs> oh, goodness. And then uh, another project I've been working on for a long time, too, another uh, place that I really love is Louisiana. And uh, this picture is of a fiddler named Gerard uh, in Marksville, Cajun, Louisiana. I did a little film on him. There's a clip of it. In fact, there are a couple of film clips in my um, in my website, one on him. Also, a, a film that I did in Texas, the same situation, called uh, Spoke, about a uh, dance hall in Texas called The Broken Spoke. Well, Henry Hornstein, just a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you for uh, coming on the Crit House. Um, it's nice to uh, to go delve back into your history and your influences. Um, thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for watching the Crit House.